Hello and welcome. I hope you all have a great Sunday evening or you had a great weekend. And uh, welcome to my first YouTube live stream um, that I'm hosting myself. Uh, it's pretty exciting. I had to set up so many things that I uh, first had to uh, wrap my head around, but I hope I managed. And um, yeah, I uh, just wanted to give you a quick outline about what we are going to talk about today. And um, I thought it would be nice to um, go through uh, an uh, editorial that I recently created together with my friend Per Florian Appegren that I have created a lot of things with, but um, Per and me, we get along so well that we decided to you know, share um, a few um, works that we did together. And um, yeah, so let's, let's uh, go through what, um, what's coming up. And um, first of all, as usual uh, in live streams, I uh, would like to make sure that you see and understand everything. And uh, maybe uh, you could just quickly let me know if, uh, if it works for you. Uh, just put something in the chat so that I can see that the chat works. Oh, by the way, um, I set up the chat the way that only subscribers to my channel can uh, actually um, chat with me and but uh, if you are like a subscriber for one minute actually I think it should be good to go and um, that being said I will um, give you a quick outline about what we are going to talk about today and um, I will therefore share uh, not this one but just a second we get to Spotify a little later um, where is it? Where is my safari? Can you see it? Yes, you can. Okay. Um, just quickly wanted to show you what... Ah, thank you. I just seen the chat. Thanks, Pavel. Thanks, Jungbio, uh, that it works. Thanks, Pedro. Great. Um, great that you're here. And um, so... Just wanted to quickly show you what we are going to be um, checking out today, either in um, Capture One and uh, Photoshop. So, Pan Me created uh, this um, uh, beauty editorial that you probably have seen in the um, in the announcement, and uh, we are going to work on that image, if you like. And uh, I will just give you a quick overview about the over the whole series so that you can see what uh, the editorial was about. So it's all about these really um, nice, smooth tonal transitions, and it has a very dreamy and soft look. And that is what um, Pair Me like to create. And I want to show you an approach in Capture One, how to develop images, the way that you can actually take out contrast and that you can um, then introduce the contrast again uh, in Capture One, more controlled with curves. Um, some of you might have seen me do that in the Capture One edit, uh, webinar that I created a couple of months ago. And um, I think it's, uh, it's a nice way to um, do some grading and do some actual um, tonal work in Capture One. It's not necessary that you do it that way, but it's one um, that actually works pretty well um, when it comes to all these kind of dreamy light situations and it comes to um, this kind of um, nice taken back colors. And uh, yeah, that's the series. And uh, just just to make it complete, I want to quickly show you Pear's website so that you can see who Pear is and uh, what he does and what we are working on together. And Per is a beauty and fashion photographer from um, Cologne, Germany. And you can see that he's been in many uh, really fantastic um, magazines so far. And uh, we also do commercial jobs together, but um, those are the ones that we like to show here um, because it shows more creativity, more um, of our own creative vision. And um, so make sure to... Um, Visit Pear's site if you like. Uh, it's it's a great source of inspiration, and I really love uh, that he is uh, sharing this uh, kind of work with me, and so that I can share it with you. Um, that being said, 
Um, you just uh, saw it before. I'm just quickly jump back to um, Spotify because, as you might know, I um, love hearing music while I retouch. And um, the thing is that I can't play the music in a stream. And um, if you like, and if you want to hear the same what I hear, um, I just recently discovered a band called The Interrupters. Um, as you know, I'm really into some guitar music. And uh, this is a ska band from the United States, and it's really amazing. I, um, if, you, if you like ska music and some good vibes, this is excellent for retouching. And um, if you like to follow along, you can just start uh, this playlist if you like and of course you can hear anything else if you like to hear some music uh, in between. I'm just going to start it myself now so that I uh, have got something in my ear because uh, nobody's talking to me and um, now I'm going to jump into Capture One and uh, here is the image um, as it was shot as you see here and I have to remove the chat slightly so that I can see uh, where my tools are. And I want to show you how to get from here um, to this kind of version. Let me just quickly zoom in so that you can see it with a 100% or a little less. As you see here, this is a shot as it was um, taken with no settings applied. And um, here is the processed raw and you can see that the details in the hair and um, the details in the skin and uh, also the uh, colors have changed quite a lot and there is more this kind of dreamy mood Oh, Petro, thank you. Uh, I'm definitely going to check that out. If that's something that uh, I can play, uh, it would be nice to actually do so. Um, but now that you saw that, I want to walk you through the steps that how to actually do that. And later, when, uh, the, when the grade and the raw conversion is applied, um, I would like to encourage you to save this preset. Um, and if you do so, then you can have it as a starting point for other images. And uh, I do that a lot. I have got a lot of um, presets in Capture One that I created from um, images that I processed or even from, uh, from other um, photographers that I uh, like. Um, sometimes we you know, share some styles and stuff. And um, for, for repeating work, uh, it just absolutely makes sense to, if you're working as a retoucher with a photographer, it does make sense to save uh, individual styles because uh, it usually happens that um, you can then um, um, work uh, on the same kind of style easily. All right, let's go to um, this image. And what I want to do first, as I said, I want to take out some contrast, but uh, the, the thing that I do the first uh, in m almost every case is to um, work on the color temperature and I want to take down the warmth a bit to something like mm, maybe here 4800 something and um, take down the, um, the tint to the greenish end some, something like one, minus 1 1.5 let's see before and after yeah it goes more into the neutral kind of direction and um, I want to emphasize the clear white and um, have it as a base. So next thing is that I am I am going to um, take down the contrast by doing um, you know I need to explain why I do that and hey Lise thank you um, you're so welcome you're not too late. We are just getting started with Capture One and um, um, with the basic raw conversion here. And but for all of you, the replay will be stored in uh, YouTube. So if you miss something, you can go back there. Um, I'm gonna take out the contrast, and I'm gonna take out a few other things that do contrast to the image because I want to bring it back in with the curves. Um, some of you might wonder why. And um, there's one reason, because um, 
when I can work with individual channels, uh, channels R, G, and B, um, I do have the option to mo to have more control over um, the uh, individual channels and introducing colors and contrasts in a more controlled way. And um, if, when it comes to professional retouching, um, it's mandatory that you have at least as much as control as much control as you can get over your files. And by doing so, um, I found that way um, pretty intuitive, but I understand that it's not if you haven't done it yet. So uh, the only uh, purpose of this stream today is that I would like to encourage you to play with it and to you know just check it out. And uh, by having taken down the contrast, um, the next step that I want to do is work on the clarity slider, and therefore I'm going to switch to classic mode because the uh, the natural one or the neutral one they have more impact when I take it down and I want to oh sorry classic one I want to move here to minus 74 75 ish or 73 doesn't matter something like there I want to have it really um, if we if you push down the um, option button if you work on a Mac and uh, click here, then you can see only that change. And um, I want to take down the structure as well. Maybe something mi minus 60. So you see that if I zoom in, um, if I zoom in, you can see um, that a lot of contrast is taken out and this kind of dreamy, um, I call it dreamy, I don't know if you call it dreamy, um, sense of light starts to appear here. And that is exactly what Pear wanted for this series and um, that's how you get there. Um, okay, next thing that I want to do is um, bring in some exposure a little more, uh, maybe something like plus 20, 20, uh, 0.224. And uh, now the, m the magic high dynamic range comes into play. This is a really fascinating, um, fascinating tool because now I have control over um, the highlights and the whites and the shadows and the blacks. And having this in four sliders now, a couple of versions back in Capture One, it was different. And um, so there were just uh, shadow and highlight sliders, uh, but having the white and black control is, is, um, is fascinating because you'll see in a second. Um, I want to bring in a little more uh, highlight. So if I go very far, you can see that the white color starts to blow out, but uh, I just want to emphasize it a little bit. And um, I want to open the shadows a bit. You can see what it does. I want to open them just ever so slightly. And now I want to play with the white slider because it's too white. But by putting it down all the way, you can see that it doesn't really darken the image as much as if I would do it with this one. And um, I want to pull it down to something like minus 40. And by doing so, you can see that I balanced out the shadows and highlights. Hey Ruben, thank you for your comment. You are so welcome. Um, and you know, we love contrast with the Luma curve. Yeah, Luma curve is great as well, especially if you don't want to change colors. And um, you can, but um, as we will be moving to the curves, you can see what I meant. Um, but now that we are, um, I'm working down my way here, and I want to take down some saturation as well, and. Um, maybe some minus 20-ish, let's see. Yeah, so minus 20, 21, something like that. All right, now, if we take a look at before and after, you can see that we dealt with um, the color and we have taken out the contrast, and now it's time to bring it back. And um, as, uh, as young Wuyo said, uh, Introducing contrast with the Luma curve is definitely something that you could do. 
for instance, like a very small S-curve, and um, then you have got a lot of contrast in. That's nice. Um, but I also want to apply a little grading um, when working with the individual curves in the red, green, and blue channel. So I'm going to take this back, move to the red channel, and now um, I'm going to put a few points, and I'm going to show you what I mean. So first thing, I want to introduce some red into the shadows. Therefore, I'm going to pull it up to um, 20. And um, I have taken note on all the points that I'm setting now. So please bear with me while I put those in because I want to make them um, exactly as I did when I was working on the image. When I did it first time, uh, I w it was more intuitive. But um, now I know why I want to go, so I have wrote down a couple of um, uh, points so that I can show you. And we don't end up with a different result. So I'm going to set a point here, and if you, if you activate a point, you can uh, then take the um, arrow keys on your keyboard and work on precise numbers. And I want to... Um, and it looks weird now, but believe me, it does uh, look nice when, when we're done with that. And now I want to go to something like 56 here, yes, and um, this is going to be 118, 120. So um, what it does, I'm introducing a tiny S-curve. And this is going to be 181 and 100, oops, 198. So this is uh, one for the red channel, and you can see that now that the other channels haven't been done yet. It does look weird, and it has this red greenish tint, but it, I have introduced the red into the shadows already. And now it's going to be the green one, and uh, therefore I don't want to introduce any green into um, the shadows. I'll leave it at zero. The other next point is going to be um, 25.19, so I'm going to also introduce contrast into the dark. And this is going to be um, 69.58. And you don't have to take these precise numbers, right? I just want to make sure that it does look the same as I had it before. Um, the main purpose is to have a S-curve introducing contrast, and it varies slightly over the uh, different channels, and then it starts to add a little grading. Uh, it's very subtle, as you will see in the end, but it does make a difference. And I cannot have that control when I work with the contrast uh, slider or if I just work, I don't know, with uh, the um, clarity. And now I want to put the next one. It's 181. And it's... Uh, 197. This one is not right yet. It has to be 120. 123. And uh, um, why I want to be s that precise is because uh, the channels or the curves in Capture One are very sensitive. They are really, um, just one notch is, um, is introducing a lot of change. I don't know if you've noticed that, but if you work with that, um, it's good to have uh, tiny changes to move where you want to be. All right, let's go to the last channel. This is the blue one. And here I want to start with something like that. And... Uh, 66, 56, uh, it's, uh, then the uh, mid-tones are, are going to be uh, different now than in the other channels. 121, 121, so that's, yeah, George, it definitely is. Um, but as I said, uh, you can then, uh, save this as a preset and you have it as a starting point if you want to work from there. That's what I like to do. You know, I have got this, these settings and these styles as I, they are called in Capture One. And 
once I have those, um, I can have that as a starting point, introduce it and adjust from there. So I don't have to do it all over again. You got to do it once and then you have it as, uh, as a starting point. All right. Um, this is going to be 175 and uh, 189. And this one is 226, 231. All right. And um, now that you got this, um, we can see that we have the grain in, uh, the grain, the grade in, the grain comes later. And um, now there's another really powerful tool that I want to use, and it's the color editor. And the basic one is just fine for that. Uh, you can work on individual colors. You can either um, use that direct color editor. I don't know if you have used this. Um, yeah, Nico, we, we will see a before and after. Um, I can show you just quickly with the curve. Um, see, that's what the curve did. And if we remain this, um, this nice dreamy colors, uh, dreamy tones, and just introduced a little more contrast and have this kind of uh, color grade also ready there. And now the color editor is essential because I want to um, change a few colors because it's a little too reddish, it's a little too greenish, and uh, we can also take out some some other colors or dial them back or change them uh, in terms of view. And that's another reason why it's worth uh, to save it as a style later. Um, so I want to work uh, on the red and put it a little more to the warm side of things. Let's go with even numbers, six. And uh, I also want to introduce a little more saturation to... Um, to the red, and I want to okay, see um, when, when I use the lightness, I can darken certain colors. And I love to play with colors, and I love to play with grades. And uh, it's it's uh, it's definitely something that if you do it for a couple of times, you get more feeling uh, for it, and you see the benefits. Um, I can understand if that is something now that is possibly. Um, weird or does, doesn't feel like familiar but it's uh, it's a great way to you know just check it out and let me know later if it helps you because um, I'm really curious if, if this is something that only me uh, likes or that uh, possibly something that you would enjoy too okay um Maybe a little lighter, the yellow. And we are just working on the skin tones now, right? Yeah? Uh, red and yellow are the skin tones. Orange is more like the dress and kind of in the middle of the skin tones. And um, now we're going to go to the green one. And I want to shift it slightly over, take down the saturation. You can see that the greenish tint uh, is dealt with here. I don't want to have it that green. Um, maybe something like minus 29. Uh, and um, maybe also lighten it slightly. It's, it's a very tiny difference, but um, it's nuances now. And I know where I want to go, that's why I do it. Um, one could also do that in Photoshop later. But uh, having the control in Capture One is nice, and I uh, definitely want to take the most control, as I said earlier. Uh, cyan is definitely something that I want to reduce in saturation. It, it, uh, it's in the, it's most of the times it's in the transitions and uh, from the tones and I don't want it there as much. Um, also blue, I want to take down the saturation of the blue a bit. It's in the eyes and I don't want them to be over poppy. 
take down the lightness a bit. And now just the, wait, let's go with the purple. And I think that's it. Let me see if we can see a little more here. I don't know if you can see that. It's a very subtle move, but uh, possibly not really visible over the stream. Anyhow, um, now there's two things that I usually do when working on editorials. And um, what I usually do is take out the sharpness completely. I don't want to sharpen images as um, as of right now, because if I, if I do, and if I leave it with 180 as it was, um, I do have a little sharpness there that um, can get in the way of retouching. So therefore, I love to sharpen images in the end. And I'm going to take it out. Um, and the same with, with film grain. Uh, the Capture One film grain is really nice. But having the grain in the image before retouching um, can lead to some frustration when you are cloning and healing. Uh, it can uh, interfere the, uh, the grain um, profile, or not profile, what's that? Uh, the, the grain appearance. And um, because in the end, I, I want grain and uh, I want to possibly go for a bigger grain and it should look something like that. Uh, I don't know if you can see that. And let's give it a little more punch. I want it to be like that, but if it's like this when I retouch, I possibly um, destroy the grain or I copy it in a way that it might leave a trace that I was there. And I don't want to be, uh, or I don't want the work that I did to be visible. So I always say that retouching is like being a ninja. You do something and you don't want to have uh, anyone see that you leave some traces. All right, so I'm going to take out the film grain. And this is the, the whole um, edit. And you can see that we are now prepped for moving on to Photoshop. Right? Oh, again. And um, now I want to show you how to save that style. You go to um, Adjustments, Styles, and say save custom style. Then you can see what you changed during the raw process and you can click save. And um, now I have to move this or now I have to move the chat, <laughs> otherwise I can't see that. And um, I'm gonna go for the desktop and just call it test because I have another place where I save this. And now it's there and I can work with it and um, I can go to the next image. This is the close up from the series as you just saw on the website. And um, I'm gonna apply this now. Adjustments, styles, and it's called, um, oh wait, is it there now? I, I saved it here too, but um, let's go for the one that I actually saved. I can import it possibly. I Let's see. Uh, desktop. Here it is. I'm going to open it. And now it should be there. Oh, did I do something now that I... Ah, there it is. Test. All right. I'm going to apply this. And it... It has everything there, right? The curve, it has the, uh, the changed um, color edits. And I only have to work on um, some individual settings like the exposure. This is too low here. I want to have it a little brighter. And um, I also want to lower the saturation a little more. And um, the HDR, is, uh, it has to be dealt with here. And um, uh, therefore, I need to bring in more light again. And I can leave the shadows and the white can possibly stay like that too. So I've got the grade here now. And I can do the same here. But I also, you know, um, I, if you 
not if you decide not to save the style, you could also use this um, copy and apply, or you can just uh, hold Command Shift and C for um, copy and go to the next image and apply it there, right? So you can see what it does to that image. And um, just is the exposure is a little too high, maybe something like that. And let's see what we do with uh, the highlight. It's too bright. And you can see that if we put those next to each other now, you can see that they go pretty well with each other. Uh, with, with each other. So, as I said, I want to work on that one today. So I'm going to show you how to export it now. Um, I can use this export dialog, which is new in Capture 121. It's, um, I want to um, open it in Photoshop. That's why uh, I'm choosing this one. Uh, I want to work in 8-bit. 16-bit is, uh, I know that discussion of 16-bit, 8-bit, and uh, we don't want to get too religious now, but um, as I know that it doesn't have drastic tonal changes that I'm going to apply, 8-bit um, is more than enough, uh, and I want to send it right to Photoshop. And um, having 16-bit does make sense if you um, have uh, gradients that you want to... Uh, introduced into the, uh, into the image, or if you're working uh, with a black and white image, it does make sense to have, you know, a lot of tonal informations. And um, it, uh, it's, it's a personal choice. I mean, most of the times, even in commercial works, it's not really necessary. The files get huge, and if you have got a big composing or anything, uh, it doesn't really make sense to All right, that's a comment. Let me just quickly check it. Um, dreamy area look reminds me of magazine photos, so this is how it's done. <laughs> yeah, that, that's one way to do it, right? And uh, there's many ways that lead to um, a desired result, but I really found this one interesting and more personal, and uh, I like that style. I don't know if I'm going to do that forever, or in, of course not in every image, but if it comes down to this kind of uh, looks that we're aiming for, that's definitely one way to do it. Um, true, um, Pavel, um, those styles work if you have some kind of the settings, that's why I save almost every style um, from all the different um, uh, gradings or um, um, raw conversions that I do. Um, what did I, I, I showed some photos outside, yeah, true. Um, the the style that I used there um, was done for that image. It was based on something like this dreamy uh, color uh, colorway, but um, the you have to see that the contrast is is uh, the only thing that I changed with the curves and uh, and slightly colors. And um, you can use that as a base and move from there. And if it doesn't look good on the images, you don't have to do it like that. But yes, I, uh, I took it and I used some, some other grade for that. All right, let's move to Photoshop. I hope it's coming there. Yes. <coughs> Now that we're here in Photoshop, I'm using Photoshop 21 still for almost all my work since um, whenever a new version comes out, I'll, I'm installing it and uh, having it on my machine. But uh, as long as I'm working on commissioned work or on uh, something that uh, is, um, has to be in control and uh, I, I always use the versions that are running and uh, or running safely as I know them. Um, although I know it's you know it's tickling in the fingers to check the new versions. And um, but as I said, I wouldn't recommend uh, jumping into the new versions right away, especially when uh, an update of um, the macOS system or Windows comes along at the same time. It's always good you know to it, there's the reason why it's called never change the running system. Um, so what's going to be the steps that we do now in uh, Photoshop? It's uh, first, I uh, would like to do some liquify. 
Uh, thank you for the question with the sharpening. Um, in this case, I, uh, in case you missed it, I um, didn't sharpen at all. Um, I sharpen when I'm done with the image because I want to preserve the skin texture and um, that's why I didn't do it. It depends on the task, but uh, I know that I'm in control here. I could have sharpened it, but I don't want to, especially the hair and uh, the skin to be sharpened yet because I need to do some retouching there. And um, so first it's going to be some liquify, um, then there's going to be some, some retouching, like uh, healing cloning, and then it's going to be some touching and burning, we're working on the eyes, we're doing some color correction, and um, we're doing some grading, a slight amount to enhance the grade even a little further. And then it's going to be finished with sharpen and grain. And um, so now let's get started. I'm going to uh, duplicate the layer uh, with uh, holding Command J. And I'm going to call it Lick for Liquify. And I'm going to jump into the Liquify filter. And I'm going to show you what I'm about to do. There are a few things that I want to do. And uh, I want to give a little more volume into the hair. And I want to um, take out a few bumps, just to make it a little more neat. And as you can see here now, just want to have it a little more round. And also pull this out slightly. You have to be careful with hair, um, because... Oh, I'm really sorry. Ah, how did that happen? Now you should see it. I'm really sorry. Um, I, have, I have to get used to that uh, Ecamm software that I'm using. And uh, there you set up uh, some scenes. And uh, I'm going to do it again then. I think you can see it now, right? Um, so I just duplicated the layer. You can't? Just wait. I'm going to wait for someone to tell me that it's fine. Okay, now it's okay. I just duplicated the layer, and they probably heard me say it, and I called it Liquify, and I'm going to move into Liquify. So sorry, uh, but I have to get used to that, and I'm certain that it doesn't happen in the next... <laughs> doesn't happen in the next uh, stream. All right, um, I'm just going to... round the hair here a bit. I don't want to have it as bumpy. And I want to make it a little bigger. I w you have to be careful when you liquefy hair um, because it can leave traces, that it gets blurry and uh, therefore it's good to you know move with a very low setting, no hard pressure. All right, and let's see. Yeah. And this is personal preference, right? You don't need to do that. Um, I, I like to keep shapes more um, even and round and uh, to emphasize the natural curves that are there. Um, and also, I'm specialized in hair retouching and it's kind of a thing that I need to myself to do in images. I love uh, having a good flow of hair, and but it's not necessary that you do it. And uh, I want to bring in um, a few of the bumps in the closing here, just to make them less prominent, like there. And I, as you see, I'm changing the size of the brush. And I'm not afraid of changing the uh, sheets because it doesn't, it doesn't really uh, play a big role there. It's, what's it, what's the word for? Uh, having this unmade sheet. Okay, let's try it with this. Just want to 
even out the lines a bit. Let's see if we need, we could probably push this in a bit because she's pushing on her leg and uh, it doesn't really um, add to the image or add to her beauty that if we leave it like that, we can just even it out a bit. And um, there's this, the, the, the sole of the foot, I want to push it down a bit. Not to have it as big of a black hole there. One could go there with uh, with a clone stamp later, but um, I think it's fine like that. What do you think of entering Photoshop with a flat file and doing contrast color correction and grading in Photoshop? Yeah, Ivano, um, that's that's a way definitely. Um, but I f but I personally feel that the um, the amount of control that you have over um, colors and tones uh, before you go to Photoshop is more um, valuable because there is so much more information before uh, transferring it to Photoshop and reducing the uh, amount of tones and the amount of colors. That's why I do that. All right, let's zoom back and see what we did. Uh, it's quite a lot actually, but um, having these lines straight doesn't really um, take the viewer's eye from her face then and from checking out the clothes and it's a fashion editorial so this needs to be nice and clean and neat. All right, um, now that this is done, um, we can start with uh, a retouching layer and um, I like to work on an empty layer and uh, fix it so that it doesn't move. And um, capture one, now that I see a question here from Pavel. Um, oh, I don't know what you exactly mean, but I, um, I think um, capture one, for the biggest difference from capture one raw conversions to um, uh, Photoshop or camera raw um, versions is that you do have a difference in color. Um, if you put in the same settings in both programs, like um, in, in the um, color temperature and in uh, some clarity or in, um, in especially in the, in the curves or in the sh shadow settings and highlight settings, mm, Capture One renders especially um, the more saturated colors way more precise and um, the details in shadows are more visible than you would. If you have the same settings in Camera Raw, um, it renders it with less details in the shadows and uh, I prefer Capture One. Uh, it's a personal question and um, there's nothing wrong with working with cap uh, Camera Raw, but um, as I have a lot of photographers that I work with that, sh uh, that shoot with Capture One, I uh, usually get the EIP, EIP files uh, that's converted raw that you can send uh, without a session or without the catalog. And uh, having sessions is a great way to, you know, um, be on set, take the session with you, and you got everything that has been like, for example, like uh, checked with the client already, and you have got some start settings, and um, on the other hand, um, you also have got some, some settings. Ah, that's what you meant. All right. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad that uh, we're on the same page here. And um, yeah, being said, I really prefer uh, Capture One having more control and uh, that's, that's why I do this. Now, um, we got to make a decision here now. Um, I can retouch the whole image and or we can just retouch uh, a few um, things to point out what to look for. Uh, I don't know how long you are planning to stay. Um, I would say we do it quickly and see how far we can get. Um, and uh, or what do you feel? Maybe just throw in if you are willing to stay a little longer to see how the whole image is uh, retouched or we can um, be a little faster and skip a few uh, distractions here and there. 
I'm going to start now with just doing the, the most prominent retouchings. Um, I like to work with a healing brush with a very low, um, low, a uh, very low size. And we have got this issues here on her forehead. And I just want to check that I use a good source to sample. Till the end, George. All right. <laughs> All right, um, I'm going to work on the texture here. And, and there is, there is a, thank you, uh, Pavel. There is, um, of course, so many ways to work on skin, uh, to work on texture. And uh, I like the manual ones where I don't have... Um, automated ways. Uh, it doesn't mean that I don't use frequency separation, for example. I uh, find a lot of value in it if I can uh, apply it in a way that it really supports my work. Um, of course, you can do it with skin retouching. You just have to be very careful that you can easily overdo it. And that's what I want to avoid on all cost. Thanks, uh, thanks so much, RFSS. And um, so I'm just going to continue quickly. And um, of course, I'm a little slower now than I usually are when I need to concentrate on talking at the same time. I don't know how you do it when you retouch. Uh, I love, um, as I said, hearing music or uh, I can easily listen to podcasts. I can also have phone calls if it's not too complicated ones. Um, but I really love the meditative way of retouching. Do you listen to music when you, uh, when you retouch? All right, now that we take a look at the before and after, and the benefit of working on an empty layer is that you have control over it, right? You can set it to current and below the tool and then just work on it. And now I'm going to, since the forehead was kind of pimply, is that a word? Uh, it was necessary to be a little more active there. And here is just not that much. We can deal with it with... Uh, touch and burn and there's this oops there's these dark uh, shadows here that I want to get rid of and whenever something doesn't really work uh, Apple Z is a great friend of mine a command Z Oh, great. You all listen to podcasts. So um, if you don't mind, just uh, if, you have a, if you have some suggestions, just uh, maybe we can all exchange uh, some sources of inspiration or great podcasts here in the chat. Um, I'm always open for new ones. I want to make sure that this white light is a nice straight line and doesn't get interrupted by um, dark spots. There's one here, and there's this one here. But these ones are easily removed with um, the healing brush. And I just want to work on the texture issues that are here now. And I will zoom back a little. Don't have to. That's what is good to do every once in a while, you know, not to be zoomed in as much. You know, Pablo, I think we all started out someone and someone. And when I started, I definitely sucked. 
one of my first mentors, Robin, uh, he had this one sentence that I will never forget. He, he told me in the beginning that you have to put the hours in. And um, he was so right. I don't even know if he knows how right he was. Because you can take a look at so many uh, educational material right now. Um, and you can watch so many tutorials. But if you don't do it yourself, you will have it all in theory, but you will not be able um, you will not be able to really apply it to your images. So you have to do it and you have to do it a lot. Yes, um, RFSS, I am using a Wacom board and um, I have this Wacom pen, it's a slim pen that I like more than the bigger one, but I also like this 3D pen. It has three buttons. <laughs> And by having it, I can have more control over a few uh, actions or uh, overlay menus uh, like, like this one here. Um, this is a Wacom menu um, that I really like. You can set some brushes here or um, you can have adjustment layers here that you possibly can bring in. You can uh, do it all manually and um, we can definitely speak about that in another video or in another stream where I can show you how to set it up if that's interesting for you because it can be a time saver and it can be very valuable. Valuable. All right, um, I'm going to switch to the spot healing brush now which is great for hair and for flying hairs and I want to show you why. Um, if you put it to a size that is a little bigger than it and you use the... Um, What's that called? Uh, pen pressure activity. You can then paint over that hair and it will remove it. And I want to remove those hairs that are going in the other direction. Sometimes you have to go over it once or twice or three times um, and you have to get used to that too. But it's a great tool to retouch hair in an easy way. And I'm also doing that when I'm retouching hair for uh, commercial clients and it's a really great tool and I underestimated it in the beginning, but it, if, you, if you use it right, it's awesome. Okay, let's see what else needs to be done here. Um, it's always a personal choice, you know, if you want to remove single hairs like that. And um, I tend to be very picky, but um, it always depends on, um, on the actual size that is shown in the end. So if it's a billboard, uh, it does make sense to work very detailed. If it's just for social um, communication on, on Instagram or uh, maybe just tiny ads in, in magazines or um, if it's a full page in a magazine, it does make sense to be very precise. Yeah, pen pressure, you know, look, look at that. Um, Oops, wrong tool. Uh, spot healing brush. If it's not on, I, it uses the whole the full circle, right? And it does too much. And if it's on, you can just ever so gently move your pen on your Wacom board and it does a tiny stroke. And you can push a little more and then it helps you as you need it. All right, let me try this line here. Yeah, does work. All oh, these lines here are removed easily with this. Let's move a little faster. Um, I made the decision to remove moles in this image. You don't need to do that uh, as personal preference or if it's for if it's a celebrity image, you have to be careful when removing uh, birthmarks or something like that um, because there are so many 
more images of uh, celebrities out there. You don't want to have it different than all the other images. Now I'm going to switch to the clone stamp tool now with a low opacity. And what I want to do now is just even out these darker parts here. And I'm um, using a shortcut to toggle the layer on and off. And it's, uh, it's a Photoshop um, shortcut that you can all use. It's called Hide Layers. And uh, you find it in the shortcuts, keyboard shortcuts. It's called Hide Layers. And you can assign a keyboard shortcut to it. And it helps me to quickly see what I did. Um, I can do that here because, um, I, I mean, working with the clone stamp because it's not very sharp. It, there will be no texture issue, and especially because we introduce grain later. So I can save some time here, and I don't need to be super precise with uh, dodging and burning. And as I... All right, I don't want to go too far, and therefore I need to, oops, I moved the, no, I duplicated it. Uh, as I said, I don't want to go too far, and therefore I need to zoom out and check how far I went. I think we can work on that bone here a bit more, and here. Kind of like it like so. Yes, and we can now move to dodging and burning. And um, therefore, I create two curves. I have got a few actions here that I use, um, but it's just two curves that it creates, um, a dodge one and a burn one. And it's, as you can see here in the properties, it's just a regular curve with a black adjustment. And um, it sets my brush to certain settings that I like. And uh, it's, I love to work with the opacity set to um, 10% and flow to 100. And I like to activate smoothing so that it makes the moves a little more smooth, as it says. It's not too rough. And um, I don't know if someone of you has seen um, my video on my help layers. Um, or if you actually downloaded them, you can download them on every video that I have on YouTube. I just uh, put them there as a free download. I really like them to give me some control. Um, I have, I've been asked a couple of times um, why there are so many, and I just have three active. That's why I. Uh, that's because I um, created a set. <coughs> that I use for all different tasks, but um, for the Dodge and Burn Wagger, most of the time only use the solar curve and the luminosity, and I want to show you quickly how and what the benefit is. This looks, of course, very weird, and you can't really use it for dodging and burning, but it does emphasize uh, problem areas. You can see here or here, these are the uh, more in the macro, and if you go in a little deeper, uh, you, you see the, these kinds are the, um, the more the micro touch and burn things. And um, I'm going to introduce um, just a black layer, black solid color layer uh, on color mode to um, take out the color. And uh, I like using the brightness and contrast layer. Um, it, it is set to these settings, but it's um, just a starting point. You know, I can use the, the slider now to go through the image and see these kind of areas more prominently as if I would just use uh, the luminosity. Um, I know those 
areas are more exaggerated now. They are very prominent, um, but that's the key here. Uh, I want to have it very prominent and um, just then be very quick and by going through. And I do have uh, a keyboard shortcut. Actually, it's a script that um, my friends uh, Stefan Kola and Pratik Naik have created uh, now that I, um, I told them that I really hate using um, two curves and having to like move my pen over here and change manually between those layers. And uh, it's, it's uh, now that I can just click um, Command X and switch between the layers while my mouse is here. And you can download those uh, for free on Pratik's website, Infinite Color, I believe. I um, will later uh, put a link into the video description of this video so that you can find it if you like. It's really handy and uh, it does make sense to, to use it. All right, I'm going to quickly move through and show you um, what I mean by having this kind of control here. I'm just... Um, and a good idea is to start burning um, because we all tend to use uh, the dodge curve more than the darker one. And I don't want to make it too flat, but um, it's good to work on the, on the dark areas or to darken the areas before uh, going too much into uh, the, the lighting because it gives you a more natural result in the end, I think as if it would be too lightened up. Let's see what we did. That's quite a lot actually already. And uh, if we take down the... You, I don't know if you can really see that. But it does give a more smoother um, skin image here. And um, I'm just going to change the settings now to reveal a little more of her face and I can see the more problematic areas on her chin, on her uh, cheek and I want to work on that. Oops, wrong curve. <laughs> want to darken that and just even it out a bit. As I again, I we always need to make sure that the image doesn't get too flat. And uh, it's a good idea to, when you're done with dodging and burning and you have it on the curves, that you um, zoom out to see the full image and see if you reduce the um, opacity of the dodge and burn layers just to make sure that you still have a natural result. We don't want it to, we don't want to go overboard. And it's very easy to do so, especially when you're zoomed into the image. And um, yeah, I will link it in the end, uh, in the description. And there is a nice video that Pratik created on it, uh, how, how the uh, scripts actually work. I recommend to watch it because there's also a, a thing called layer, layer carousel. You can for example, I have those two sets uh, two set to um, to be like changing when I hit Apple X, but I can also like take these four and activate them, and then I can go through these four with the layer carousel, layer carousel script, and it's very handy. I I absolutely love it, and it. Uh, it's um, making my retouching life much easier. All right, now let's move through her face a bit here, darken a few parts. And by having it set to 10% opacity rather than working with a very low flow, um, it feels more natural for me to build it up, the effect, rather than um, having to keep keep it pushed until the, I hit the sweet spot. Um, but I do both. I, uh, it depends on the image, but I, if, if you ask me if I have to choose one, uh, it's definitely 10% opacity and 100% flow. 
And I don't like working on a uh, soft light layer. Because I do have so much more control with two curves and I can use it separately and I can, you know, if I went too far, I can, oops, I can uh, then change it here. And if I have it on, a, on an empty layer and work with it, it uh, it's a different kind of working and I don't have as much control. But it depends, you know, um, if it's a personal project or just a quick edit and it's not commercial work or not really professional work that is needed, then it everything does the trick, right? You need to do what, what is you. And yeah, it's, uh, I just found out that by doing it so many times now that I, I really like that control that I have. And it's, it's really good to work in a non-destructive way. That means that having the pixels and everything pixel related below, then work with the light on top and then later work with the colors on top. Then you always have to control over the full image. And now um, I want to quickly show you that there's an invert uh, layer that I can now activate and that helps me to navigate um, even better through some more problematic areas. The only thing that you need to take in mind and that I haven't pointed out in the latest uh, video that I created on this, uh, I, for I forgot, is that of course then you need to switch uh, in your head between dodge and burn because then the dark spots might to be dealt with with the burn layer, right? Or vice versa. It happens uh, through because of the um, because of the contrast in the image. Here, the dark parts are now dealt with with the darken, so don't get confused by that. But if you deactivate the help layers, you see that this is a bright spot and uh, not really a dark one. It just happens because of the inversion. And this, if this is uh, too complicated or you just say that, hey, uh, this is completely nuts and I don't want to do it like that, that's fine. I don't want to push you to do it. I just figured uh, by accident at some point uh, that this is really handy, having this uh, brightness and contrast slider, at least for me. And it does help me to get really nice results. And uh, yeah, feel free to do it or just do it however you want to do it. There's no one right way for everything. All right. A few more strokes here and I think we are good to go. This is something that is not really visible. We can switch to the regular uh, view. And just quickly check what we did. Yeah, it's evened out nicely now. I just quickly want to do one thing, um, since again, um, it's possible to do with uh, with the clone stamp in a very, s in a very, um, let's say, uh, is it decent way? Um, I just want to reduce the flow too, and just uh, dark uh, lighten her eye bags a bit with a very low. Um, clone brush setting here. We're not destroying any texture there and um, we will introduce a lot of grain later so it doesn't really make it an issue here. And uh, I don't know what's wrong with the zoom tool here. Uh, sometimes it makes this weird stuff. Uh, let me introduce the help layers again because for skin uh, on legs and arms it's pretty great as well take the invert out go back to the brightness contrast and just move the slider to a point where it looks right right that's enough for me to see the differences here 
and I'm gonna just quickly even those out. Not taking it out completely, and there's there's always the option to dial back the opacity later. And it does look a little bit more exaggerated in this uh, help layer view. All right, and I want to lighten this a bit and make this transition from light to shadow a little more smooth. This is mostly the key, having smooth transitions from light to shadow and from midtones to lights and etc. It's pleasing to the eye and uh, in those kind of editorials it does make sense to do so, unless you want a very edgy contrast look. Zoom out. Possibly here on the arm. I'm darken that a bit. Just even it out like so. And here. Okay, now just the elbow. And I think we are good here now. And if there's something that pops up later, we can definitely do that. But let's see both of them. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Um, <coughs> quick sip. Now that we have, um, now that we have the dodge and burn done, um, we can move on to um, the eyes. Eyes are always something that I like to put in a, oops, in a group. Call it eyes and use the, um, the pen tool to create a selection just quickly around the inner eye. And also here. And then um, I don't need to save that pass, I will just activate it by uh, pushing Command and hitting the layer here. And then I can um, hit that little layer icon down here and uh, I can now move to the blur tool with pushing J and uh, just soften the edges a bit. And now I want to throw a curve in it and uh, let's see how we do it this time. Um, I'm gonna take the eyedropper for the darkest tone and put it here. Oh no, that was a completely wrong approach. I wanted this one to put a point here, not to set the uh, color. I want to put a point here and I want to put a point on the white. And then I can bring in a little more contrast to the eye. And I don't want to have too much, but maybe I will reduce the opacity a bit. Yeah, and then I will throw in one hue saturation and take it all the way so that the eye white gets more neutral. And then I'm going to hide it with the black ink. Oops, no. Like so. And then I'm going to use the brush in a different setting. I want to have 100% and I will just desaturate the red in the eye. To have a little more neutral eye here. Okay, now I see that I, I want to work on one more 
uh, one more uh, point here at the on the eye with Dodge and Burn. This is too much of a difference here. Oops, wrong layer. And this is how it goes. You know, you go through the image and it doesn't always uh, go after a certain uh, order. Um, sometimes things pop up when you come back to an image or when you just did one step and then the nose also here could have a little more dirt and burn. You wanted it all, now you have to deal with it. <laughs> no, just kidding. Um, I think that's better. Okay, um, so the eyes are done. And after eyes, we can now move to color correction. We don't need the help layers anymore. And I just want to quickly save the file, just in case. Uh, it's in the output folder. Okay, I will just save it there. Because it can happen that Photoshop freezes and everything is gone. And it happened a couple of times lately, actually, and I don't know why. Uh, maybe it happened to one of you. Um, I usually have the autosave on, and it didn't, uh, it didn't do it. Uh, autosave didn't work, and um, I don't know why. And I, nobody could tell me yet. And I was very frustrated that I had to start over with two files. And if you have a solution for that, please let me know. That would mean a lot. Um, okay. Now I want to work on the skin tone. Call it color correction. And uh, I want to even it out a little bit. And therefore, um, what I love to do and is... I don't know why it's that shaky. Um, it's a hue saturation layer, and um, I'm going to throw it in globally first, but um, you can see what it does. Um, I want to move the master slightly to the right. Same goes with the reds, just plus three or so, and I want to take down the yellows by a lot. What it does... It evens out the tones, and I don't want to have it globally, right? I just want to brush it in where I need it. I want, for example, the skin reddish uh, parts here in the, in the shadows. I want to bring them a little more to the yellow side of things. Therefore, um, I'm going to fill it with black color, if it lets me. Hmm. Okay, I think it's because of this. All right. And now I can brush it in to even out the tones. I'm going to set it to mm, 25, 25%. Just brush it in here. I don't know if you can really see the difference through the stream, I hope, and uh, I hope that you can see what it does. It just evens out the skin manually where I want it. And we can work on the hands a little bit with that, take the red out. And make it a little more even. The hands are still a little bright, we can work on that too. Let's see what the feet do here. So now I'm just shifting colors. I'm not applying any color. I'm shifting the red more to the yellow where I'm gonna brush it in. You can do it very roughly. It doesn't need to be super precise because the outline here is is uh, white. It, there won't be any color shifts that you can apply there. Okay. Be 
before and after. It's more even now. And um, what we can try now is create a gradient map to um, quickly uh, even out the, the tone on her arms, but we could also do that with a curve or with a um, with another hue saturation layer, but um, I want to show you why and how to use the gradient map. Gradient map is um, actually it uh, alters the colors over um, the whole range of the tonals, uh, tones that you have in the image. And before we can do that, we need to fill it with black and then um, take the gradient editor and uh, this is the darks. So this is, we first have to shift this around. And I want to pick a dark color of her skin. And I want to move it over and uh, I want to leave the complete darks out. And I can do that by reducing the opacity here so that we don't shift the complete dark um, tones. I'm going to do the same with the highlight color. Uh, oops. And I'm going to throw in a point over there and then I can take the opacity out there. We only have two tones now. Um, we can definitely put in more. So maybe one less darker, or maybe from here. Yeah, that's better. And maybe one from the mid-tones here, and one brighter one from here. That should be fine. And then we can set this to color. And then we can try and brush it in and if it already is uh, good values, let's try. And uh, it's, it's very possible that we have to reduce the uh, layer opacity because it can look fake fast if you are not careful, but it evens out those color shifts, as you can see here now. But this is with 100% and it's way too much. But it does uh, add to the image, right? And it, it helps to even out those color shifts in a very nice way. And I'm going to take it down to something about 40, 50%. Let's see what it does. Yeah, that's possibly enough. Yes, so the whole color correction before and after. I hope you can see that. You can see it here, uh, especially on her arms and the fingers. It's more even now, the um, neck and the chest and also the legs. It works like that. Okay, that's fine. All right. Um, I think we are almost ready. Um, what we do now is uh, we are going to sharpen the image. That before that, we save it. And I want to create a stamp. That was with the Wacom menu. That was pretty fast. But I can also show you how to do it manually. You can hit the Command, Option, Shift, E and create a um, layer stamp on top. And uh, I'm going to call this Sharpen. You could um, turn it into a smart object. Leaves you more options in the end. By the way, I haven't seen a comment yet lately. I hope you're still there. <laughs> and um, let's see. Uh, we can go to Sharpen and for instance, you unsharp mask. Let's 
zoom into 100%. And you need to keep in mind that for what you sharpen this. If it's for a magazine or if it's for a billboard or if it's for web output, you need to uh, consider the distance that the viewer has to the image. So if it's on the phone like this, it's very near, you don't need as much sharpening as it would be uh, on a billboard that is probably a couple of meters away. If you got that, uh, it does make sense to put in more sharpen to have that uh, distance uh, view. All right, um, I think the radius is a bit too high and the amount is a bit too low. I want to... Yes, Nico, good to see you. Um, so that amount of sharpening, that amount of sharpening is uh, enough. And now I want to introduce grain and therefore I use my uh, grain patterns. I did a whole video on that. You might have seen it. If not, um, take a look. It is really uh, an, an approach that leaves me with a lot of control. I will show you. Um, I have these patterns that I created. They look like this. And uh, I have got different ones. Um, a couple of those were created from original film grain scans. But the most of them were created with Capture One. And I want to pick one of those now. I know that these are from Capture One. Capture One. It doesn't say it, but it is. And um, the benefit is that I can now have it on a seamless, um, seamless pattern. And it, uh, whenever I change the dimensions of the file, for instance, if I let me just quickly uh, clear that. If, if you use the, um, the crop tool and you extend the file to the, to the right or the whatever, uh, and you hit OK, it, you know, it grows with it. And you don't have that when you have grain applied from uh, Capture One beforehand, or uh, if you have grain applied in, in, in any other way in Photoshop. Um, this is completely adjustable and uh, it does make such a big difference if you have that much control. Let me go back to the original size. And the other thing is that I can introduce the grain uh, and reduce the opacity or I can double click it and change the scale, which does make sense in um, many cases. So if you go to 150%, you can see that it's way bigger and uh, it does make sense to have that much of, much of control. But uh, again, um, there's no need to do it like that. I just love it and I think it is a very valuable tool. Uh, I'm going to go with 125 because I want a big grain here. And I will introduce it with uh, the soft light blend mode. And now let's zoom in to 100% and see what it does. Yeah, it's with 100% and in this case I think we can do that. And you could change it however you like. And uh, yeah, I feel that we are pretty close. Yes, we, we are done, actually. Let's see the whole before and after. OK. Of course, um, you know, there's always something that you can do. <coughs> and, um, but for the sake of this uh, session today, and not to make it too long for all of you, and for me, uh, I think um, you know now how I deal with an image like that. You know um, what kind of steps can be taken to, um, to retouch, uh, to do the raw conversion, and of course you can also um, you can see how I use the dodge and burn tools. And um, so there's no magic trick, right? There is, uh, it's just techniques. And it is um, some help layers that I created for myself that I think are very handy. And I like to have that much control in sharpening and in uh, having the grain. So I, uh, I'm done with the image. I hope you liked it. And um, as I said, um, we can definitely pull in uh, 
a quick Q&A. If you got any questions, um, just let me know. Uh, I will switch to, um, to a bigger uh, screen and um, from here uh, we can uh, go to the Q&A and um, I'll have a quick sip and I'll leave it for you with a couple of questions. <coughs> By the way, um, what I'm listening to right now it's some more ska actually, but not uh, long ago it changed from uh, the interrupters to something else. How, um, RFSS, um, how to export from Photoshop? You mean uh, how I save the file and export it to, uh, to send the file to a client? Of course. Um, I can first of all save this, <coughs> then I switch back to, to Photoshop, just a second. And uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna save it. And um, what I like to do is to duplicate the image um, to, with Command Option Shift D. Oh no, command shift D, what is the, oh no, what's the, there we go. Okay, now I want to create a merged copy, or let's call this final, and then I, um, let me switch the view. This is the copy, and um, then I will reduce it to um, flatten the whole image, right? And uh, I'm gonna clean everything, so I'm gonna check if there's any layer masks or channels, or um, alpha channels in it, there's none. I wanna throw away the path, and then I'm going to save it as a TIFF file. I like to give TIFF files away because um, I can use this kind of image compression here. Um, this option here um, helps me to reduce the file size um, but keep all the details. If it's opened in Photoshop again, it's not compressed anymore, uh, like n not technically. But, you know, um, all the details are still there. So I can save it like so. And that's how I would deliver the, uh, the file. And then I usually give JPEGs too. So I just save it as a, save it as a JPEG and uh, reduce the quality to 10, not to have it too big, which is 7 megabytes. And that's how I export it. All right, next. Um, Pavel, thank you. Um, danke. Grüße zurück nach Wuppertal. <laughs> um, thoughts on the Dehaze tool in Capture One and Photoshop? Um, yeah, Dehaze, let me just go back to the working file. Dehaze is actually uh, something that can be used for grading, uh, or I used it for grading. Uh, let me just quickly. Um, Camera raw and create a convert to smart object out of it. Just a second, and then we go to filter camera raw and use the dehaze slider. Uh, where is it here? What it does, um, it enhances contrast or um, can also take out that contrast and um, introduce, I think it's dealing with um, saturation and contrast, does it? Let me check. I haven't used this tool for a long time. I think it's just working with the color, does it? Yeah, it's, an, it's a nice way um, I 
I like DHAs every once in a while, um, especially when working with uh, a um, smart uh, filter, or it can use it can be used as a smart filter, which gives you a lot of control. I um, it depends on the image, but I like to have a final grading uh, with uh, with an smart object layer uh, every once in a while, and yeah, it does make sense because you can also then. If you use it as a um, smart object, you can um, transfer it to other files of the series and then uh, have the same setting. Um, I like to work very... Um, I, think I like to have the control over the image. And if I'm working with image series, I need to make sure that if I transfer um, these layers to the next file, that I got something um, that I then can apply there too. And therefore, I, uh, if I would use dehaze or any other thing, I would definitely use it as a smart object. All right, next one. Um, so you basically sharpen the whole image because you didn't touch the threshold. Ye yes, um, exactly. I reduced the threshold to 1.2, which is, I think, not nothing. But um, yeah, I wanted to sharpen the whole image because I didn't sharpen it at all in the beginning. And uh, that was another question with Unsh George. Uh, yes, I used unsharp mask, right. Um, you can also use smart sharpen and... Um Thank you, Martin. You're so welcome. Um, you can use all kinds of sharpening tools. Um, it, it depends on uh, what you prefer and what gives you the best result. There's no one way. I, I used to sharpen with uh, high pass to or um, I once had a plugin that did it and uh, I also have this um, what I also like very much is uh, the this uh, infinite retouch um, panel of Stefan and Pratik because um, let me quickly create a stamp uh, just in case. Um, it has this uh, sharpen tool here which um, allows you to set the viewing distance, which is very interesting when you know what the output is. Uh, for instance, this one is good for uh, a magazine, and if I apply that, it gives you uh, a nice amount of sharpen, and there's uh, some smart algorithm behind that that can sharpen it for um, a certain distance. And if you would do so now with uh, with a higher viewing distance, let's just check it for, let me go to the metric system. Uh, let's say 300 centimeters. It's gonna be a lot more. Right, and um, you need to imagine that you are far away from that then. And then it does make sense to have a certain amount of sharpening, <coughs> although I think it's a bit much. Um, do you use a skin color tool? Do you remember the second name in Capture One? Yes, um, for example, to even out the brightness and color. You prefer to deal with it skin in Photoshop? Um, Pavel, this is a very good question, and uh, I could have done it in Capture One. Let me quickly go back there. Um, For example, I need to remove the chat a bit here again. Um, it's here, a skin tone tool. Where is it now? Color editor, just closed. No. Come on. Okay, now if, if you want to use that, um, let me zoom in a bit. Not so much. Um, what you can do then is um, use this color picker and uh, use the tone that you like. For example, mm, let's take this one. And then you can see that you have got a range and this can be adjusted. So the smoothness can be adjusted and you can view the selected color and it will take out the... Does it do it? Did it show something? Well, um, what it does, then you can 
uniform it and um, you can I have a feeling it doesn't show anything does it I d yeah, it does okay sometimes it's a little laggy I thought um, okay what I like to do is apply it with this kind of intensity and uh, to have more control you could also do that on a separate layer right and um, I think it needs a little more uniformity here if you want to check the arms um, but then I would certainly um, do it with a layer and brush in a mask because uh, it does too much to the hair now because it's all similar in the clothes um, I in, in this case I wanted to do it in Photoshop but there's definitely a huge use for the skin tone tool here let me go back to Photoshop and to your questions uh, the standout was the use of the gradient map especially the adding of points could we have a quick recap uh, sure, um, George, um, let me go back there. It's in the CC layer, color correction. So the gradient map... Here. Um, the whole key of the gradient map is to even is to bring in that gradient of colors throughout the image right and uh, since we only want to use it on the skin um, we need to have a mask and we only have to um, put the colors of the skin in and um, I think the the darkest parts of the skin and the lightest parts the, the the light on the skin shouldn't be altered too much so that's why I have put in a few more points and um, I could have taken those out too but in this case I thought it would be nice to to leave those out uh, the darkest um, the darkest parts of the tonal range and the highest ones you don't have to do that but it gives you in my opinion a little more natural result and um, same goes uh, with the highlights and um, I think five points, how much did I put on? One, two, three, four, five. Five points for the skin is a good value because then you have uh, a nice spectrum of colors and um, it's necessary to find a good dark spot to have a, a dark quarter tone, a mid tone, a light quarter tone and a highlight and um, that's what I would recommend if this answers your question. And then once you have established uh, the gradient, you then um, set, uh, you can leave the opacity at 100% in the beginning, but then uh, you use a, a mask to, to brush it in. And let's see again here where it was necessary, right? So it was here uh, on the arm and the hands and when applied, it's, uh, it's evening out the colors. I hope that answers your question. And Young Bio, you have a more question. Um, how do you know if the exposure in your final image is enough? Well, um, you can. We can answer this uh, in a in a technical way. So um, you could probably use the um, the histogram, and let's go for the RGB one. Um, or you use it, or you go by eye, you know. Um, if, you, uh, if you see it, and that's one thing, when you retouch a lot, and if you uh, are familiar with photography and you're doing it for a long time, you get a sense for colors and for light. And if you do so, um, you will get a feeling if it's too dark or not. Um, definitely you should check out that it's not too bright and therefore the histogram is, is also uh, valuable because if, uh, if there's a clipping um, and you don't take care of it or let's say um, of course you can go too dark or too bright but then it's a, it's a style element. And uh, if you look at um, um, famous photography 
you can see that many photographers use very dark shadows and it almost breaks apart and that's, that's some sort of style. And then it's great. Uh, and the same goes for highlights, blown out highlights, but you need to make sure that it's still printable. And when it's going to print, you need to have uh, some, uh, you need to have some, some sort of um, information in the darkest parts and in the lightest parts, because if you don't and the brightest areas are too big, then it can, um, can trouble some, or it can introduce trouble into the printing process. Um, are there any more questions? Let me see. I don't think so, right? Um, well, if you, um, if, you had, if you have more questions, um, you know that I do have a um, Discord channel. Uh, it's also linked in the video description. You're free to join there. Um, I just want it to be a place, you know, where we can exchange a few thoughts between videos. Uh, in the last couple of weeks, I didn't have that much time to create new videos. There were, um, there were um, some jobs, of course, that I need to do, and uh, I had uh, some some flu lately, uh, not flu, but a cold, and I needed to have some rest. That's why I had to reschedule the setting uh, the session for to today. Uh, but I'm uh, really enjoying this kind of live um, uh, videos as well because it does allow us to you know, connect and to um, have it a little more interactive. And if you're up for that, uh, feel free to join uh, next time. And if you have a certain uh, topic that you would like to cover, and uh, we could also do uh, just, just a Q&A session. Um, if that's something that you're interested in, um, just let me know, send me a link, uh, send me a text uh, via Instagram or a voice, and uh, if you have a question that you would like to ask in person, you could also send me a voice message, message over Instagram and I can just play it here, uh, if you like. And um, other than that, um, I am looking forward to the next session and to the next video. And um, yeah, if there's no more questions for today, um, I would uh, call it a day. And I am very thankful for your time and that you spent your time with me here on uh, the Wacom board. Yeah, Nico, thank you. I'm, I'm really fine now. I just had to take some time to recover and uh, also take care of my family, my wife and my son. And uh, everybody's healthy and everybody's good now. So looking forward to a great week ahead. And um, again, thank you all for, for joining. It was a great first life experience uh, on my own for me. And uh, it was great to have you all here. And I'm looking, to the f uh, looking forward to the next one. So I'd say let's call it a day. Um, take care of each other and take care. Have a good night. Bye. <laughs>